This presentation is titled Beyond the DOM, what's in the accessibility tree for you? Um, I guess for most of you that title wouldn't make much sense yet, but it will hopefully after this presentation. And yeah, I, I just couldn't, you know, I, I had to, to do a reference to the DOM in Utrecht, etc. So that's why I put it in the title. But it's, it's true, it's, we go beyond the DOM. So what's, yeah, it works. Great. So what's, what's in this presentation today? Um, I want to answer a few questions. So we, we get started with how, um, oh, just a second, oh, my Braille device is having some Bluetooth glitches. Yeah, there it goes. Um, so how do screen readers interact with web browsers? Because there's a whole world out there you probably haven't heard and, and seen before. Um, where screen readers need to communicate with browsers to, to get what they need and to, pr to present stuff in an accessible way to the end user. So the next question is what information do screen readers need to, to present uh, a web page in a meaningful way? Um, then we are going to see how to, uh, uh, how to uh, uh, check what a screen reader will see without actually, actually using one because using screen readers can be quite difficult if you don't do it every day. Um, and then we are going to have a little look into the future uh, to a new API called the AOM, the Accessibility Object Model, which I think is very exciting. Um, so let's start with some, oh, just a second. Um, yep. Yeah. Why is this not working? Yeah, there it goes. Uh, browsers and screen readers. Well, that, that's what, what I was fighting with just a few seconds ago um, to get to the next slide. Um, some history. How did screen readers start working with browsers anyway? Uh, a long time ago, somewhere in the 90s, screen readers started uh, working with browsers and trying to represent information that was uh, conveyed using HTML on the web. So how did they do that? They just parsed the HTML that was uh, in, the, in the browser's memory and uh, reconstructed the web page, sort of, and created a, uh, a kind of, of internal model uh, and presented that model to the user. And uh, you, you can imagine that kind of recreating an HTML parser in a screen reader is, well, these days it, it, it will not, not work because you would, you would have to create a, a total browser. But then it, it was quite simple and it did work some, uh, uh, to, to some degree. And it, it was the first start to, to access information on the web uh, for screen reader users. So improvements were, were needed and came, I think, uh, like around the beginning 2000. Um, where we, we got accessibility APIs. And accessibility APIs or the, the, the platform, native platform APIs for accessibility are still around these days. And the, the first iteration of these APIs are quite primitive. Uh, it was a huge step forward because it, it was the first formal way uh, to communicate accessible information. And uh, uh, we had, for example, on Windows we had MSAA, Microsoft Accessibility API. Um, and later on Linux, we, we got APIs as well in Mac OS. But the early, early APIs were quite lacking in detail. Um, you had the basic information, but f stuff like text formatting and uh, like uh, alignment, uh, colors, fonts, that, that were just, just absent. So it was pretty basic. Um, and uh, the, the, a very important thing that this APIs added to the whole interaction model was that uh, uh, you could send events uh, to a screen reader. You could, you could say, hey, look, the, the page has changed. And that, that became very important when uh, we, we got JavaScript and Ajax coming up and we had dynamic pages. Because uh, before that, you just had to, to give the screen reader a command to, to re rebuild the whole page model when something changed. And because you didn't know something changed, that was very confusing and didn't work out. So um, then, uh, we improved more on this, and that's a, a bit how we, uh, how we are doing this today. 
But by the way, I, I did lots of research for this presentation. I really liked it. And uh, I think I have uh, scrapped like 90% of the information I gathered from these slides because it, uh, you know, I could, I could do a, a whole day about this and all kinds of performance impacts, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I just cut it out because we, we just have uh, 50 minutes here. So uh, now we have an accessibility tree. And the accessibility tree is like a kind of second uh, tree that's out there. Uh, and that's, that's the interface between your browser and uh, what we call assistive technology. So that's, that's a screen reader or speech recognition or any, anything that presents or augments a user interface for a specific group of people. And um, the accessibility tree can be queried via the APIs I talked about and the, uh, the newer versions of those APIs, that, which have much more features. Uh, the tree is always based on the document object model. Uh, so for every node in your DOM, there should be a node in the accessibility tree describing it. Uh, or sometimes nodes are left out for performance reasons, but generally that's, that's the one-on-one -on -one mapping. Um, and it, it should contain everything uh, a screen reader or other assistive technology need to, um, to, to know what's on the page and, uh, and, and to uh, inform the user about all kinds of things that are, are, are there. Um, so getting data from the browser goes as follows. The screen reader queries uh, uh, the accessibility tree via those native accessibility APIs. Uh, and then most screen readers uh, still make a kind of internal model uh, to represent the web page to the user. So, um, uh, the, the virtual model I was talking about uh, is, is kind of like a, a, a document view where the user can uh, navigate a web page using arrow keys like you would go through a, a text document. Uh, so you can go line by line and word by word, uh, character by character, and usually that's not uh, not possible in in a normal browser. So that's that's uh, a special interface uh, a screen reader adds on top of that. Uh, and there are lots of hotkeys. Like almost every letter and button on the keyboard will perform some kind of action. Uh, for example, to go to next heading, next form field, next uh, hyperlink, etc. So there, there's lots of, of, of new interaction being added by a screen reader if you read a web page. Uh, so I want to do a very quick, uh, very quick demo here. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think we can do this time-based. Um, I have here in this other window that should be on screen right now, the a very familiar website for some of you, I guess. Uh, it's from some conference called, uh, how is this called again? Um, yeah, front end united. Yeah, that's it. Front end united. So when I enable this viewer, it's called speech viewer. You should see a little window, uh, and this little window tells you what the speech output would be saying. So now you should see link schedule. Is that in, is that in, uh, in viewer now? Yeah, uh, link program. So I'm just arrowing through this web page, which is not normally possible, and I can go to the next heading, like this, next, next, and I can go back again, and I can even create some, uh, some lists of links, uh, or a list of headings. So you get lots of navigational aids to, uh, to explore a web page, and uh, for that navigational aids to work, you you should structure your content well, otherwise, uh, yeah, I would get a, an empty list of headings, for example, and that's not really helpful. Um, so I will keep this demo very short because we are a little bit out of time. And now I should press a few buttons to be able to go to the next slide. Yeah. So the other way around, processing events. Uh, what I mean with, by that is, for example, when I uh, explore the, the web page, uh, uh, and I want to activate a link or a button or enter something in a form control, uh, somehow events have to flow back from that virtual model that the screen reader builds to, uh, to the web browser. So, for example, the user performs an action. For example, I, I press spacebar or enter on a link, 
uh, and uh, in most screen readers make space by work as well, but in a normal parser you just only can use the enter key. Um, then the screen reader will send an event uh, to the accessibility API, it will go to the to the specific node in the accessibility tree in the browser, and the browser will translate that event uh, to uh, to an event on the related DOM node. For example, uh, that enter key on the link will result in a click on the on the DOM node of that A element. So that's the other way around how events go uh, go through that that whole infrastructure. Uh, so what does a screen reader need to present this all? Uh, the basic stuff, and we call that name, role, and value. Uh, so what's a name? A name is the label of an element. For example, if you create a link and it has a link text, uh, that link text will be the name or the label of that element. Uh, but to make it more complex, you can have labels that are not uh, visual. For example, if you, if you add an old uh, attribute to an image, uh, that will be the label of that image. And uh, you can do modern things like area label and area labeled by to, to provide labels. So that's the name of an element. What, what's, what's it called? The next one is role. And that's what, what, is it, what is this element meaning? What is it doing here? For example, roles could be a button or a link uh, or a, a paragraph or just no specific role at all. Just, I don't know, it's something like a, a div. A div has no role. Um, uh, so th that's, that's telling us what uh, what the element is and what you can expect from the element as a user. And the value is a bit strange. The value is, uh, in some, t uh, some, some kinds of elements, the value is what you enter in there. For example, in an input, if you enter some text, that will be the value. If you have a link, uh, the, the href, the URL that you pointed to, that will be the value. And some elements don't have values at all. So that's a bit of a strange one. But those are the basic uh, information building blocks that, that are used. But there's much more. There's uh, stuff like uh, like states, like focusable. Uh, something's editable. Something can be required. Uh, something can be uh, uh, in in the viewport or off screen. Uh, uh, and there are other attributes for specific elements as well. Like uh, if if the role of an element is a heading, it should have or it, it may have a level. And the level says which uh, level of element it is. And um, uh, you, you, so, you, so you can have much more attributes in the in the tree for every element, um, and that ma that may depend on the type of element that you are you are looking at. Then there are actions, and actions are uh, those building blocks that go the other way around. Like when uh, when I trigger something from the screen reader, uh, an action will be sent through the accessibility APIs to the accessibility tree. Like focus, when I uh, tap to a form control, uh, or when I arrow to a form control to to, uh, to, to uh, focus on it, th there will be uh, a focus event going through this whole infrastructure to notify the browser that, that I'm uh, I'm currently reading that, that 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 element in the screen reader view of the web page, and that should be focused. Uh, or I can activate the element, so it's, for example, by by activating a link. Uh, there are lots, lots of other uh, actions, and uh, every accessibility tree seems to have a, a bit of variable naming for various actions. So there's there's a bit of a uh, diversity there, but uh, usually uh, it's just a, a few actions like focus and the main thing like uh, uh, activate the link or click on the button. Um, so uh, that accessibility tree is out there, but probably you, you didn't know because you never see it anywhere. So how can you see what's in that tree? A few ways. The most obvious one, of course, is use a screen reader. Um, that's good for like real-world end-to-end testing. Um, if you know how a screen reader works, that is. And screen readers are very complex pieces of software. So if you don't use them often, you might not know uh, about 80% of the features. And you might not know what would be the expected output that you should get. Uh, so it's it's a kind of a black box test. You uh, you 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 try it with a screen reader and you see if it ex if, if if the output matches what you would expect, which not is ne not necessarily what's the right one uh, right output that you should get. Um, so that can be difficult for some people because 
when you don't know how a screener works or you, you don't use it often, it's, it's hard to be efficient with it. Uh, besides, most screeners are not really optimized for visual output. Um, what I did in the demo, uh, I opened a speech viewer, you see some text what the speech is saying. Um, and uh, in some screeners you might open another window that displays the text that's sent to a Braille display. Uh, but it's not really easy visually to see what exactly is going on. Uh, well, because the screen reader is not optimized for that, it's not, not its main purpose. Uh, some screen readers can show you a visual indication on the web page uh, where you are, which element is active, but not, not all. Uh, so that, that, that might be difficult to, to use. And you get no real insight in if something is not working as expected, where it's going wrong. Is it a browser bug? Is it not implemented by the specific browser? Um, is it a screen reader bug? Uh, or is it the book in your own code? You, d you just don't know, because it's kind of a black box you're looking at. So there are other ways, fortunately. Um, like you can, uh, oh, oh, sorry, this one, yeah. Uh, so a few common screen readers that are out there are uh, uh, and are free. So you can use them for testing NVDA for Windows. It's free and open source. Uh, Mac OS has voiceover built in, and iOS too. Uh, Android has built in TalkBack. And uh, Linux, if you work with GNOME, at least, has Orca. And they're all free, and you can all use them for testing purposes. Uh, and they all work differently. So please read the manual before you dive in. Um, there are also external tools to, uh, to see what's happening in the, in the accessibility tree. And they're all platform-specific. The only tools I know, actually, are for Windows. And I'm, I, I couldn't find tools for other operating systems. Uh, a few free tools for Windows are Microsoft Inspect, which comes as part of the Windows SDK, so it's not really easy to install. You have to get the whole Windows SDK, and it's buried inside somewhere. Um, Inspect shows you uh, all kinds of accessibility information, like uh, for, for the different platform APIs for, for Windows, like MSAA, uh, iAccessible, uh, URA and you can just uh, see uh, uh, what events and uh, data is, is available. So it's not just for web browsers, it's for general accessibility inspection. And you have the Accessibility Viewer from the Pacello Group, DPG, that's also for Windows. Uh, and that's specifically designed to, uh, to show you what, what a web browser is sending to a screen reader. So what's in the, in the accessibility tree, what's focused, what's, uh, what's available there. But still, th those are external tools, and you ha w would have to install them and uh, hope they still work with your uh, current browser version, etc. Um, so there's, uh, there are improvements on this front coming, fortunately. Uh, yes. Um, you can test stuff in DevTools, right in your browser. So Firefox has, uh, has an accessibility pane added to DevTools in version 61, which should be out really soon now, uh, or maybe today, I'm not, not quite sure. I didn't, didn't check this this morning, but it should be out really soon. Um, and Chrome uh, Chrome has it as well. Oh, and Firefox has it already available in, in the beta version or the, the uh, developer edition. And I will show that to you soon. Um, Chrome has a accessibility pane in, uh, in its, uh, in its uh, HTML tree where you can inspect a single element, and that's since Chrome 65. Oop. Oop. Yeah, there it goes. So the Chrome, the Chrome inspector shows uh, the computed properties like name and value and, uh, uh, and, and role. Uh, it also shows you uh, the, the area attributes that are, uh, that are applied. Um, it has no separate uh, panel to show the whole accessibility tree, and that's, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's problematic. Um, and uh, it, uh, it shows you uh, basic information, but it's, it's just based on a single element. And it can show you the tree, like the ancestors and the children, there are children, but not, uh, uh, not, not the whole tree at once. So this is an example of an element uh, when you inspect it in Chrome in DevTools and you uh, go to the accessibility tab, this is the information you can, you can see. 
than Firefox. Firefox is having a different approach to this tooling. Uh, Firefox uh, shows the whole accessibility tree in its own uh, DevTools uh, tab, its own DevTools pane. Um, and it does not show uh, the specific area properties uh, that are applied. It only shows you the result of what's, uh, what's provided, like an accessible name and, the, and role and all actions that are available. Um, and all other pr uh, properties that a s the screen reader or, or the assistive technology can request from the tree. So you can really see the whole tree in all the details. And to ease inspecting what exactly is happening, you can click through from that tree to the corresponding DOM node. So you can see there what, uh, uh, what HTML element is, is related to that. Um, and, you, and you can also uh, uh, go th through the whole tree so you're not limited by the direct ancestors. Uh, and you can explore from any point in the tree. Um, so this feature is currently in beta and you should enable it explicitly. Uh, so I made a little screenshot to show you how to do that. Um, so it's, it's in, in, in the beta version or, the, or developer edition and you go to your dev tools and enable it in, the, in options. And then you should get a new accessibility uh, tab in dev uh, tools. The first time you use it, it might ask for initialization because accessibility trees are not built by default for performance reasons. So the first time you uh, will have to enable the accessibility support. So I just want to do a little uh, demo of that. So when I just go to the Frontend United website uh, and I go somewhere in the navigation, I'm uh, now on the, uh, on the speakers link and I uh, right click that. And I go to, oh yeah, I don't care about cookies, but that's not what I'm searching for. Uh, inspect accessibility properties. So that's a new option that's, uh, that's added there. And it will open your DevTools. It should be uh, on screen right now. Um, and you will see a tree. And you can navigate the whole tree. Uh, and it did not do the specific link I requested. It started just at the top. And you see a skip link, skip to main content. And that's interesting. The skip link is a navigational aid uh, for keyboard users and, uh, and other users of assistive technology to directly jump to the main content. And when we expand the link, you will see that there's another text leave inside with the link text. So uh, if you go to the link, you will see some interesting stuff here. Uh, it has a name, skip the content. It has a row of link. There are actions. Uh, you can jump, so that, that will just activate the link. That's the only action there is for a link. And as I said, the value is uh, the exact href of the link. Uh, and I can go here to the DOM node. Um, and I can go to the states, the states, yes, the states. And that tells me that it's uh, uh, focusable, it's linked, it's selectable text, it's opaque, enabled, uh, it's sensitive. I don't know why exactly that's sensitive, but okay, that's, that's what the tree says. Um, so you can see all kinds of interesting stuff here. And uh, what's more interesting, if I, for example, go to the, uh, just a second, to the form field to enter my email address for updates. You will see some more data coming up. Uh, inspect accessibility properties. Um, well, yeah, there it goes. And it's called an entry. Uh, I don't know exactly why it's, why it's called an entry, but it's a form field where you can enter text. Um, it has a name of email address. That name is provided by the, the label, uh, label element. Um, and you can, you, so uh, what I said, you, you can't see here where that label is coming from. You have to look at your, your HTML tree, your DOM tree, to, to know where the label is coming from. Um, but here you can see the result of interpreting the label and sending it to accessibility uh, accessible technology. Um, and you see that the, the action for this element is activate. So I can go there and, and activate it and, and, and enter some text in there. Currently the value is empty because I didn't enter an email address. Uh, and what's interesting here, if you go to the states, uh, you will see that it's off screen because I didn't uh, properly scroll the viewport. 
so a screen reader can request this. Uh, it's, is it off screen? Yes, please focus it. And then it will, it will scroll uh, in view. And it's focusable, it's required, so that comes from uh, a required of an area required attribute. Uh, and that will be conveyed in this tree. And so screen readers will read that when you when you tap to the field. It will save email address required field. And it's also invalid uh, because there's no valid email address in there right now. Um, and it supports out to completion and it's editable and it's opaque. Uh, and so you see it, it, this, this one has lots lots of, uh, uh, of of extra properties attached. And you can go to the attributes and you will see even more. Uh, uh, like that the text input type is an email address and uh, text indentation ID, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this, is, this can be useful to assist the technology like screen readers to, pr to uh, present extra information uh, to the user. So this is all available in that, uh, in that tree. Uh, and you, you can see the display in line. And explicit name means that the name is given somewhere in HTML code um, and it's not guessed by either the browser uh, or some other layer in between. So that, that tells you that, that it's, it's properly labeled and it's not, it's not a guess of some sort. Um, let's go back here to the slides. <coughs> yeah. You have 15 minutes. Thanks. Like yeah, it comes good. Um, so the last part of this presentation is about the future. Uh, the future of this kind of interaction models. Um, well, what's, what's relevant here is that, uh, that there's a new API coming. It's called the Accessible Object Model. It's an experimental JavaScript API, and it's currently, yeah, I would say it's very experimental because the implementations that are available are not finished and are uh, all kind, kind of different. and. Uh, it's not really usable as of yet, but it's very interesting to have a look in the future and see what we can do with it uh, soon. So the specification is, uh, it has a few phases. The first one uh, is, is quite simple. Inspect and modify accessibility um, uh, properties of an accessible node. Uh, so an accessible node is uh, what I uh, told you about. That's the node in the accessibility tree, which is usually uh, for now, uh, exactly uh, uh, related to one uh, DOM, DOM node. The second phase uh, uh, gives you the ability to directly respond to the events coming from the screen reader or, or the assistive technology. The third phase uh, allows you to create a virtual accessible nodes. That's a nice term, uh, and I will go into detail about that later. And uh, the fourth uh, phase will uh, allow you to programmatically uh, have a look at the tree. So you can explore the whole tree from, from JavaScript, which might be very interesting for some uh, purposes. Mm. So there's a little table I got from the specification uh, repository on GitHub, and it tells you where this currently is supported. Well, that doesn't look so good. <laughs> um, so you see, uh, for example, Chrome supports phase one, but with out-of-date syntax. And every uh, browser that supports anything of this currently will be marked as yes with out-of-date syntax. And even the dog is, uh, is having an opinion here, it seems. <laughs> um, so wha wha how did this happen, out-of-date syntax for an experimental API? Well. The first idea was uh, to, uh, to, to, to construct uh, an accessible node pair DOM node, but the problem with that in phase one was when you access the accessible node, the whole tree had to be calculated uh, if it, w it wasn't already, and that, 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 that was having some performance concerns. Uh, so now this, the syntax will change to reflect that, and that's not yet implemented anywhere, and the spec document itself is out of date on that as well, so it's a bit hard to implement right now. But uh, it's, it's being worked on. Uh, so the phase one, what, what will phase one bring, uh, either with out of date syntax or not, it will uh, not really bring something new to the end user. 
the end user already has all the functionality that's contained in phase one. However, for a developer, this means that you can set uh, all kinds of accessibility properties through JavaScript and you don't need uh, area attributes for that. Now you have area attributes uh, to set the role and to set, uh, set the label and to uh, set all kinds of states. And uh, that's still possible, of course, but now you can do that from JavaScript as well. Uh, so f for a developer, that, that will be another way to, to manage this. For example, this little code example you see here, element.accessiblenode.role is button. We'll set the role is button property on that node. Uh, and that syntax with uh, accessible node in, in between as a, as a property of the element uh, is outdated and that will probably uh, go away soon. And from what I saw, it's going to element the role is button. So it will be a direct property on the element. Um, a, an element here refers to an element in your DOM. So every everything is uh, well is, is queryable using these properties, and, and you can set them as well. Um, so what's a relevant use case for this? Well, um, you can uh, set the required attributes that accessible attributes you need if you're building a custom component and uh, say you, you're providing a custom tag named uh, my custom toggle, <coughs> toggle button uh, and you would have to instruct all your users of that component to set the required area roles uh, uh, attributes such as role uh, to properly implement accessibility where when you would use a native element you don't have to think about it because the role is defined by default it's always okay you know it's uh, defined uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the base of that element so you, you don't have to spec uh, specify it uh, and with this you can you can do this from JavaScript you can just uh, in your component get, get get a reference to the element that's inserted and set the role so you you don't have the, the risk that the user uh, will uh, forget to set this attribute or uh, set the wrong values. Uh, how this will play out with priorities, like uh, if area has uh, priority over what you set here in JavaScript, that's not really worked out yet. So that's, that's still an open question. But uh, this will be good news for, uh, for custom component authors. Uh, the second phase, phase two, allows you to handle accessible events. For example, an accessible click, so that the the, the set of technology requests to click on a specific element in the accessibility tree. Uh, accessible increment and decrement are probably a bit specific, but those are there for, for example, if you have a mobile screen reader, the screen reader often has uh, gestures like uh, flick up and flick down to, uh, to set uh, the value of a slider. And now if you create a custom slider, it's really hard to do that accessible, accessibly. Um, so with this specific events, accessible increment and decrement, you will be able to handle those uh, specific screen reader uh, functionality. And in theory, you could create a, a very custom, uh, customized accessible slider. Um, and of course, accessible focus, that's exactly the event that I described before when I go through that model that most screen readers build uh, of the web page and I uh, uh, land on a focusable control, you, you want to know that I want, want the focus to go there, to follow me. So, uh, yeah, you, you will get uh, an accessible focus event in the future. Uh, and most of these events have a, a very reasonable fallback. For example, if you don't handle accessible click, it will just fall back to a, a click on the, on the associated uh, DOM node. Um, and this is also a phase of the specification that's being worked out right now. And there are still a few uh, problems there. Uh, but well, what, why do you want this? Uh, for example, to handle screen with sp specific functionality like the slider I mentioned before, or to uh, provide a specific other user interface for uh, users of, of assistive technology. And that's a bit of a controversial topic usually, uh, because we'll usually say, okay, you should provide the same experience to anyone, but there could be use cases where, uh, where this, this is uh, useful. And when we uh, go to phase three in a, in a few moments, uh, this, this will make more sense because uh, when the phase three part is implemented, 
these events will become much more useful. However, there's a little problem right now in phase two, and that's uh, privacy concerns. Uh, for example, if you handle accessible click and you get an accessible click event, you know that the user is, u is using some kind of assistive technology like a screen reader or speech recognition. Uh, and most users don't like being exposed like that on the internet. They are like, okay, uh, doesn't matter how I access this website, uh, uh, I don't want to be profiled like, okay, this, is, this user gets a flag because he uses some kind of assistive technology. Uh, for example, if you have medical websites or insurance or whatever, that, that, that could be very problematic. So you d don't want that. We have nog seven minutes and a heel veel leuke vragen. Oké, ik ga er snel rijden. Yeah, that was my uh, personal timer. Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, so many users don't really appreciate it. Uh, and the, the, the idea now is that, that there, there will be some kind of permission pop-up. Uh, and also there, in, if you deny the pop-up, it says you, you got the pop-up, so you, you, you could handle those events. So that would still expose you. So there's a, a, a lots of discussion going on just right now. I got a GitHub update in this in my email this morning about this discussion. So it's going on right now, and uh, it's it's very important to me because I don't want to be exposed as a user of assistive technology. Uh, even though when we add phase three into the mix, uh, you can create virtual nodes, and the virtual accessible nodes are nodes in the accessibility tree that are not related to nodes in your DOM. Uh, and that's, now it's, it, it will get pretty interesting uh, because those virtual nodes will be able to handle all those events as well. Uh, so the use cases for this are quite uh, large and will be quite complex to implement, but it's good to, to have these possibilities because uh, it will be a, we, we will be able to build more accessible experiences online. For example, if you create a very custom uh, custom uh, user interface in a canvas element. Now there's not much you can do to make it fully accessible, uh, but if you can create virtual nodes in that canvas element uh, and give them positions and add handlers, uh, event handlers to them, uh, you could create a totally accessible interface for your, your graphical uh, uh, canvas. Uh, or for example, if you have a remote desktop application where you're streaming the screen contents through a video element, but you somehow you know what's in the screen based on uh, another communication channel with the, the remote host. You could draw uh, accessible nodes and uh, provide an interaction model for users that cannot see the video and still can access every specific UI element in there. We have to, uh, we have to uh, yeah, we have to uh, finish and that's, that's good because the only last thing I wanted to say is there's a phase four. You can explore the, the tree, you can build better auditing tools uh, now auditing tools are b based on the DOM, and now you can base them on uh, on the real accessibility tree. So, yeah, the conclusions, I will skip them, because you can read them yourself. <laughs> unless you're blind. Um, so that, that's very inaccessible of me, but I, I heard there are lots of great questions, so I just want to skip to the questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. That's really, really uh, interesting. We've got a l bunch of questions from the room. Um, first of all, the dog's name is Abby, who's a very good girl. Yeah. She, very good girl, yeah. That's right. So that's, that's Abby. Um, so top question is, how effective is automatic accessibility testing um, with a, a Axe, for example? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and the dog as well. Um, uh, yeah, X, uh, for, for people who don't know it, is uh, an extension to your DevTools, and it does an accessibility audit on uh, a subset of the, the International Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG. Um, I say a subset because you can only automatically test a subset of these guidelines. Um, and the, the data set they use, or the, the test set they use, is pretty uh, uh, tuned to not give you false positives. So if X says it is a problem, uh, it usually is in some way or another. And uh, I think for what, what you can do right now with automated testing, X already is quite good. Um, uh, but when we get to phase four of the AOM specification, X can become even better because it can uh, query the accessibility tree directly. 
and it will be able to tell you, okay, uh, I see in your HTML that you have used this te technique and you are using currently a browser that doesn't expose this technique in the accessibility tree. So please beware that it might not be useful to everyone. So it's not perfect, it's but not it's, it's, definitely a, a, it's definitely useful and it's yeah. a start. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. automated testing is not perfect yet and I guess it will be a while before it is, unfortunately. Okay. Um, how can we see how many people visit a website uh, and use uh, accessibility features or screen yeah. readers? Good is there question. a way that we can, we can see that? Well, that's exactly what I described in, uh, in the, the privacy part of the phase two of the AOM specification that uh, if we get those accessible events, you will be able to see who uses those events. And that will tell you that some kind of technology like a screen reader is used. Uh, now there's no way to determine that. There are a few uh, prototypes built to, 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 uh, to try to test this, but there's no reliable way uh, to detect a screen reader or other sets of technology user. Fortunately, I would say, because usually you don't want to expose that information. Right. Uh, but you, for example, uh, recently there are some new uh, media queries you can do for reduced motion, for example. iOS uh, supports that. Okay. And by doing that with some kind of background image or pixel, you could, you could detect the usage of that feature. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then just one more, because we've got to... Um uh, I've got a few announcements on that. Um, what single improvement could we make to the Drupal core software that would have the greatest positive impact oh, for yeah. end users uh, accessing sites? Uh, well, that, that's a difficult one because uh, Dr Drupal is already doing quite well. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, I, d I don't know really where to start because most core functionality is, is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I've t worked with Drupal in last, last year ex extensively, but I think, uh, uh, what could be good in Drupal core is that uh, if there are new uh, new features that uh, that are being tested and uh, if, if they are accessible they, they, they get in and currently uh, I saw some blockers that they didn't get in because they're not accessible I think that's a very very good thing you know um, some other communities say okay we do accessibility testing and we prefer that things are accessible but okay if it is not accessible yeah we just just do a few releases and uh, uh, well, we will fix it later. And Drupal, uh, what I saw from Drupal is that it has a very strong policy. Okay, if it gets in core, it should be accessible. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's rule number one. If you stick to that, you will be fine. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, I'm, that's not a concrete improvement. I know that. Yeah. But I think uh, just indicating that Drupal is, is really on a, on a good path already there. Excellent stuff. All right, everyone, give it up for Tom. Thank you.